Hello, and welcome to another Everything ALS Expert Talk Series. Please subscribe, then you'll be getting notices as our new videos come out, and you will be one of the first people to watch them. So, thank you for your interest, because we're interested in you. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to our CEO and founder, Indu Navar. Indu? Well, thank you, McFinn. And um, it's our honor today to actually uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Merit Sekovic, um, Distinguished Neurologist and ALS Researcher at Mass General and Harvard Medical School. Dr. Merritt is a chair of the Department of Neurology and director of Sean M. Healy and AMG Center of ALS at Mass General Hospital, and jo Julianne Dorns, professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School in Boston. Dr. Sakovich is one of the founders and former co-directors of NEALS, a group of over 150 clinical sites in US, Canada, Europe, and Middle East dedicated to performing collaborative academic-led clinical trials and research studies in ALS. She's le leading the first platform trial initiative in ALS and is also a principal investigator of Clinical Coordination Center of National Institute of Neurology Disorder and Stroke Neurology Network of Excellence in Clinical Trials. Dr. Uh, Sakovich also um, mentors neurologists in career in experimental therapists, therapeutics. With that, I will uh, welcome uh, Dr. Sakovich, and thank you, uh, Merit, for taking the time and meeting the people here. And we always say that you know these experts are coming to your home, to your living room. Mm -hmm. How cool is that? That you can actually get the ability to ask your questions. Please ask your questions in your in the chat, and we'll moderate once the um, presentation is done. Thank you, Merit. The, thank you. Thank yours. you, Andrew and, and McFinn and everybody for inviting me here. I, uh, I was trying to get to my uh, my living room, but I was worried that Boston traffic, I would miss this. So I stayed in my office. Um, so I'm going to share some slides here. Let's see. I have um, probably way too many slides, but I will um, just cut me off when you want me to stop talking. <laughs> so, uh, there's lot, lots to talk about, and I want to leave lots of time for questions as well. Um, so I want to update where we are on therapies, both um, you know, kind of recent results that have come in, as well as new trials that are starting. Um, and then again, leave lots of time for questions. So I do have some disclosures. I have some uh, grants uh, to the institution from the companies we work with on the platform trial and uh, many foundations. I consult for a few companies in ALS and uh, some board membership. So I'm just going to quickly review where we are in the current therapies because I know this group uh, uh, is very well informed about them. Um, talk about some of our recent clinical trials with some early results. And then what, what are some of the exciting clinical trials are either enrolling people now or coming up in the future very soon. Um, so there's a lot of progress in ALS. I know sometimes we, we have disappointing trial results and it feels like a step backwards, but I think we're taking more steps forward than backwards and there's definitely progress. And we learn from every study that we do and everything that people participate in. Um, I think the what gets me most exciting is the um, growth and understanding of the disease biology. The more we understand about the, the root cause of the illness, the better the treatments are going to be that come forward. And we know that really quite strongly from the recent approval of the gene therapy for SOD1, where we see that if you actually can tackle the cause of the illness, we can see people getting better. And that's a game changer for me. And it just it really pushes how important it is that uh, there's there's a lot of resources and focus on understanding the disease biology. Uh, we do have a few drugs on the market, um, and uh, we have a lot of things that we can do to help people's quality of life uh, all the time. But we have to obviously do much more because we need therapies that not just slow down the illness, but stop it and reverse it. Um, as Indu mentioned, there's there's many people working on this really all over the world um, and working closely with people living with ALS to try to figure out how we can go through this very large pipeline of ideas and therapies faster to really uh, pick out the best ones to bring forward. Um, so, you know, we have short-term and long-term goals um, and long-term isn't, isn't long because we need to move fast, 
Um, but obviously we want to slow down and stop the illness. And that is likely for people without a known gene that causes it to involve, th that's going to involve more than one treatment until, uh, uh, until we understand the biology better. Um, and we have to get to targeted drugs for different subgroups of people. And there's a lot of initiatives to try to get there. Uh, we're working on preventing the illness. So the first prevention trial in ALS is ongoing now for people with SOD1 ALS, and there's efforts to uh, figure out how to do that also for the other genetic forms of the illness. And as we learn how to do that, hopefully there'll also be learnings about how we can identify people at risk for ALS and intervene also before onset. And then there's a whole new initiative or really about thinking about how can we reverse ALS. And that is super exciting, um, an initiative that uh, many people are working on. And I'll, I'll end with a little uh, bit about a new uh, Vision 2030 initiative uh, working on with INDU and, and others to try to really uh, fund the research to figure out how to uh, understand the biology of reversal and how to actually develop drugs that can do that. I've lost count of the number of companies in the ALS space. There's a lot that come, it waxes and wanes a little bit, but there's over 300 in different phases. Some are very early, you know, in, in the science and the lab, and, and some are late, late stage to phase three testing. There are, um, you know, three global, if not four, global networks um, in uh, Pan, in Asia, in Europe, in the North America. Uh, that are um, bringing trials to people where they live. And we're working together so that we're testing different drugs and getting through this rich pipeline. And there's a super engaged population. Many of them uh, are, are here on this call, but it's it's like no other time uh, of, of really a partnership between people living with the illness, families uh, affected by ALS, investigators, clinicians working together to solve this um, this illness. And so that also gives me a lot of hope. So this is a messy slide, and, and uh, Indu and I have spoken about the need to have some really good uh, science talks where we really dive into each of these topics and really where are we in understanding the biology of the illness. But I'd say for the um, sporadic form of the illness, we know that a lot is going on in the cell, in the motor neuron, and in the surrounding cells, and these are all potential targets. Our current treatments on the market, you know, Rilazol works on glutamate toxicity. This is a pathway thought to kind of in a way overexcite motor neurons and cause them to have damage. Uh, Radicava works on something called uh, oxidative stress. And we know from the trials that actually those drugs work well in combination. Uh, the drug that I'll talk about a little bit, Relivrio, that um, um, now we know does not work, was targeting mitochondrial dysfunction and ER stress. And the gene therapies are targeting the different forms of the genetic forms of the illness. But there's many companies working on uh, these other pathways and trying to think about how we can actually have combination treatments so that we're tackling all the, the parts of, of the biology that's happening. The challenge we have is knowing what's the most upstream, what's the root cause of the illness, and um, is it the same in each person? And developing those tools and technologies is really just coming out now uh, to be able to figure that out. So um, I do think that the drugs that we're going to see coming forward are going to be much more effective than the ones we've had in the past. So um, while we're we're kind of work, working with the scientists on the science, we have to design ways to test the drugs quicker because if each one uh, idea is tested in hundreds of people over a year, we're going to, it's going to take a long time. And so that's what was the um, genesis for us developing this first platform trial in ALS. And I'm happy to say that there's now um, three platform trials going on in, in, throughout the world in ALS, and people keep innovating on how to do it even, even better. We have to figure out also a, a shorter way to tell if a drug is working. We have now this new biomarker called neurofilament that is a game changer, I think, is a way to, to see in a short time whether a drug might affect that biomarker and predict success. But we don't know that it's the only biomarker. And so we need to develop uh, better ones to help tell if a drug works quickly. I kind of compare it to cholesterol. Like right now, if you, you know if you take a drug to lower your cholesterol, it's going to prevent heart disease, um, dementia, it's going to prevent stroke. You don't have to do, you know, two or three year studies to know. You just have to do a short study to see if you lower cholesterol. Uh, neurofilament, in a way, is our first kind of cholesterol-like biomarker, but we need many, many more of those. We have to really increase the capacity at the sites for research and, and fund more research. And a lot of advocacy has already uh, gone into play to increase NIH and government funding, but I think we're going to need a lot more to really solve this. 
We need to make sure everybody uh, can be part of research. And I know a lot of what everything ALS has done is to bring research to the home, to the living room. And, and I, I think there's even more that we can do on that around trials. One challenge we have is, is there's a lot of difference between the regulatory agencies uh, country by country. And so the FDA has shown actually very good flexibility in the late stage approval a process, approving drugs uh, first in the US or in Canada too. Um, but in Europe, they have different uh, rules and they don't approve them on the same criteria. But the flip happens in the early phase. There's a lot of phase one trials going to other countries because of different uh, regulatory considerations. So while we really work as a community to work together to do things more efficiently, we also have to push the regulatory agencies to, to, um, to come more together so that we don't have odd situations where drugs are approved in one country that, and not approved in another. And there's been a big effort to also make sure that e even people who might not be able for whatever reason to be part of a clinical trial can have access to approved drugs through the uh, compassionate use programs that are now funded through uh, the Act for ALS. So I'm gonna briefly go through the approved products and then uh, really try to focus on some of the newer treatments that are coming. So I think we all know about Rilazole, but I did wanna point out that this was developed a long time ago yeah, as a drug that works on glutamate and has had consistent findings in multiple studies. So two studies led to approval, showed about a 10% slowing of the illness. Uh, but every study that's tested a new drug since then, when they look at people on or off Rilazol, see the same effect. So it might be a small effect, but it's, it's a reproducible, robust one. So it's a real effect, but obviously we have to do much better than, than this. Radicava was approved in 2017 in the US, a little earlier in Japan as IV, and then more recently as an oral formulation. And this is the results from the pivotal trial that led to approval. And it showed about a 30% slowing of the illness. And this was on top of Rilazole. So everybody was on Rilazole, and then half the people were on the Radicava, half on the placebo. The, um, the issue uh, with Radicava right now is that since it wasn't approved in Europe, another company called Ferrer um, took a different formulation of the same drug. So it's the same chemical, but they made it as a, a different um, uh, granule type formulation. And they just reported a big phase three trial that was negative. We haven't seen all the results. And so two questions I have that I'm waiting for before really knowing how best to advise the people I care for is, uh, are we comparing apples to apples? Like, is, does the drug get into the brain the same amount? Does it get the same blood levels? And um, we know from the studies with, with the Radicava from MT Pharma that the drug worked best in people early in the illness who had a faster course. And so what I also would like to see the sub-study uh, results, but they haven't shared any of this. And they're planning to share it in June at the NCALS meeting. So uh, personally, I've, I've advised the people I care for that if you're on Radicava, you're doing okay with it in terms of side effects is to stay on it till we have the full results in June. Uh, but this is a very personal decision that people need to discuss with their neurologists. Relivrio, as we know, was approved here in, in, uh, in um, uh, about a year and a half ago based on a, a small study and a lot of advocacy that including myself and many of you on this uh, call uh, to, to try to uh, convince the FDA that it, um, it was a good thing for ALS to approve a drug on a single study um, uh, because of the seriousness of ALS. And so this small study showed about a 25% slowing in the loss of function and a, a small survival benefit as well. But as we know, uh, it was repeated a study uh, called Phoenix in uh, many more people, 600, longer study, a broader population, and really a global study. And that was unfortunately recently reported as negative. Uh, so most likely this drug will get pulled off the market. Um, but I think there's some important lessons here. One is it is important to repeat studies. I still think very strongly that this was the right regulatory approach. And I, I really hope that that continues with the FDA, um, to, that just like for cancer, for serious cancers, that if we have a positive phase two study, it can go to market while we do, or the field does it, another replication study. This is one of the first replication studies to be done that quickly. It was really 17 months from approval to getting the repeat studies. Many of the time, um, the companies never do the repeat study. And that's one of the criticisms about the early approval. But here, I think the companies showed they did it. The other thing, and we're really digesting the data is, um, you know, 
is this that the drug just doesn't work, which is very, I think very likely, or is it that you, when you go to broader populations or when you go global studies, you might increase some variability that makes it harder to pick up small effects. And I, I think we just don't know all those answers yet, but hopefully as the results get uh, shared, uh, we will understand this better. Uh, but I know that was a, a sad day in our field, but I'm, I think the next, I'm hopeful that the next one that gets approved, hopefully on an accelerated basis, will have a different outcome when it's repeated. So the other, you know, the other thing that really happened last year, which is a huge success for many reasons, was the um, results of the first gene therapy for ALS. I, I will show Susan's picture because she was the first person I ever cared for with ALS. Her and her family had SOD1 ALS. Um, so this was approved. It's a gene therapy. It's called an antisense oligo. So it's a piece of genetic material that gets into the cell, finds the gene target, and can block it from making the, the, the protein, the SOD1, that causes the illness. And it, this was important for many reasons. One, obviously, for the people with this form of the illness, it's really, it's very exciting and hopeful. But it also gave us a new biomarker, this neurofilament, as a possible way to to predict a uh, clinical response. And we saw people get better, which was just um, amazing. And, and you know, we, we knew it was theoretically possible, but we saw in this illness that when you turned off the cause of the illness, about 40% of the participants got improvement in strength. Now we have to figure out why not 100% and uh, can, we, can we do even better? But uh, it's something that was visible um, in all the clinics. Um, so, very excited about this. Um, and there are other gene therapies now for FUS, um, as well as an, an, a lot of efforts for C9 as well. And uh, the whole technology of turning on and turning off genes is not only for people with genetic forms of the illness. They can be used to target uh, proteins of interest uh, in sporadic disease. And in fact, there are two gene therapy trials going on now for the non-genetic forms of ALS, one of them by Biogen that uh, decreases this uh, protein called ataxin 2 and one by Curalis, which increases this protein called Staphmin 2. So you can use the same technology to modulate um, targets of interest. So I'll just show you a few slides from that because I know this has been shown a lot, but the, the this drug was approved based on the change in a biomarker. So it's called an accelerated approval. And in green are the people who are treated uh, six months earlier than the, the people who started on placebo. And you can see a rapid drop in this neurofilament in both the plasma and the spinal fluid by 12 weeks. Um, and then when people in, who got the placebo first went on active drug, the same drop. And um, this was um, highly related to the clinical outcome as well. And this is what led to the accelerated approval. I mentioned that, that about 40% uh, of people got some um, improvement. Um, we measured this in different ways, uh, these different scales, and improvement was uh, defined as either you know, um, stable or, or better. Um, and, uh, it, and we did learn that you know, people who got uh, the treatment earlier had, were more likely to have this big effect, and also people who had uh, lower levels of the neurofilament to start with, so slightly slower course were the, also the ones that, uh, that have, are more likely to have improvement. But again, there's a lot to learn about this and, and other ways to, to um, try to get these numbers even higher. We also kept following the people who were in the very first study with the SOD1, the phase one part of this. And you can just see um, by the flat curves that there are many people doing really well from this treatment. We don't usually see these types of curves. So again, this is very helpful. So, that's where we are as far as what we have on the market. Um, there are several drugs that have some positive uh, phase two data. I'm, only, I'm gonna show you data from a few of those, but the, the ones, the first uh, six uh, in the blue and the purple have had some positive results uh, presented. Uh, the ones in red have been negative clinical trials. Um, the ones in the middle are active uh, late stage trial. Um, so there, there's a lot of activity, and I'm sure I'm missing some um, on this list as well. I'll just say the methylcobalamin is a form of B12 that's been studied in two studies in Japan, both of them suggesting this has a benefit in people who start it within the first 12 or 15 months of their illness. IL-2 is a study um, done by the Europeans. It's a drug that helps uh, decrease neuroinflammation by increasing your T uh, regulatory cells. And they reported just in a meeting um, that positive results of this drug uh, about a year ago. Uh, we haven't seen all the full data. Um, Prime C, I'm going to show you some of the data. 
Um, and the next two were two that we tested in the platform trial um, that have some positive results and are going forward to phase three. So I'll show you a few of the, of the data points and I, I, uh, I see Alon is on the call, so hopefully I won't say anything wrong about Prime C, but they shared the, these slides and I'm working closely with them on this clinical trial um, that's really being led uh, by Dr. Vivian Drury in Israel and many other people. So Prime C is um, a formulation of two uh, drugs. One is ciprofloxacin and the other one is celecoxib. And the mechanism um, is, is really attacking many parts of the biology and that complicated graph. This, co this covers a few of those biologies. The first one is on RNA um, uh, on metabolism. They were looking for drugs that regulate something called microRNA. And RNA is kind of the, how, you're, uh, how you get proteins from your genetic material. And it also works on something called iron accumulation, which we know happens in people with ALS and can lead to oxidative toxicity. The other drug is works on um, neuroinflammation, glutamate, excited toxicity, and oxidative stress. So the study uh, was a phase two study. Um, it's a small study, uh, 70, about, uh, um, about 68 people were randomized either to active drug or placebo in a two to one ratio for six um, months, and then uh, put uh, uh, rolled over into an open label extension for up to 12 months. And the main goal of this study really was safety, biomarkers, and looking at preliminary, um, look at, at uh, uh, clinical outcomes as well. Uh, so a couple important things, um, about 90% of people were on uh, Rilozole as well. So in a way it's a combination of, of the prime C on top of Rilozole. The groups were very well balanced in enrollment in terms of key things that, that uh, predict clinical course. Um, uh, it was very safe, so that was the main outcome. Um, and we looked at safety by tolerability, how many people were completed the, the study, the six months, and didn't have uh, you know side effects that led them to stop the drug. And about you know ten percent of people on the prime C stopped the drug early, versus about twenty percent on the on the placebo. Really, no serious side effects. This is the um, uh, looking at ALS FRS. There's two populations. One is called intent to treat. Those are the people who everybody in the study, you know, regardless of whether they uh, you know followed the protocol completely or not. The PP, which is probably not the best word, but it's a per protocol analysis is uh, the people who um, completed every part of the study. And as you see, for both populations, uh, the people on Prime C had a slower course than the people on placebo. So this is good, very good data. It's a small study, uh, and it really needs to be replicated. Um, again, as we saw from the Relivrio study and other studies in ALS, it's really important uh, to repeat these uh, these studies. But it's certainly uh, very uh, hopeful. Um, we also looked at the different domains of the ALS FRS, and we see on on really each of the domains, um, you know, different you know, people doing better on the drug versus placebo. You know, a slightly larger, you know, effect really in the respiratory, but uh, seeing it in all uh, different domains. And this is one of the important things to do on ALS FRS is really look at all of the different domains. Uh, we also looked at, um, you know, uh, survival and, you know, fortunately most people survived it, but we did see, again, a, a benefit to Prime C on um, uh, survival as well as other measures like time to certain changes in these scores called king stage and minor stage. So everything in the same you know, positive direction. Uh, we don't yet have the neurofilament results. Uh, we're obviously waiting for that. And there's many other biomarkers, including measures of TDP43. Those all be coming in the future and will be important uh, in decision-making uh, for the next steps. But the hope really for this is that it goes forward to phase three testing. So I want to just uh, briefly, because I've talked a lot about the platform trial, so I won't go through all of it, but I wanted to show uh, talk about results of uh, three of the uh, five uh, that we have results on. So the idea here is that is to um, not do test each drug at, at a time, but use an infrastructure called a platform where we can run many drugs at the same time. Each person is in one of the drugs, but we can share the data on placebo so we can really uh, lower the number of people not getting the active drug during the randomized part. And we can also be faster because in these platform trials, when you add a new drug, you're just amending the protocol. So for example, we started with three drugs, what we call them regimens. And then when we added the fourth one, that took 30 days. So if we were gonna start it on its own, 
that would take about a year because we have to build the whole infrastructure and find the sites. And so in the platform, you, you can easily add and drop drugs. And then we added the fifth one, same thing, about a month. And then we added two more. So uh, it, you get efficiencies um, in having uh, needing fewer people because you're sharing data between uh, the regimens on the people on placebo, and you have time efficiencies on getting things started. Uh, so, but it's one protocol, one uh, ethics board. Um, we have 70 sites, and we've um, you know about 1,300 plus people have been part of this. So that's really amazing. And this is data that, as we are finished trials, we make available to the community. So if you come into the study, you're randomized to one of the active drugs at that time. So right now, for example, we have two regimens, uh, F and G. So if somebody was coming in, they would be randomized to one of those two. And then there's a second randomization, um, uh, and we have a three to one. So 75% of people get active drug, 25% get placebo for six months, and then everybody gets active drug. But when we analyze a, a regimen, let's say regimen A, we take the data from the active group in regimen A, and then we use the shared placebo. So we can have a lot of power to tell if the drug works or not. And that again is one of the values of the platform trial. We tried the, for the first five uh, purposely to pick different targets. Um, so the first one, Zalucaplan worked on complement. The second one look, worked on um, inflammation in the brain, something called myeloperoxidase. The third one works on how your, your cells make energy. The fourth one worked on something called the sigma receptor, which is um, important for bulbar function. The fifth one worked on um, autophagy, which is a, a way that cells uh, um, uh, can get injured and die. Um, and the, the sixth and seventh one, though, we um, are, are working on a similar target. Uh, they're, they're different drugs, but a similar target of something called integrated stress response, which is important part of how uh, TDP43 aggregates and disaggregates. So those are the seven in the trial. We have results for the first five. And so uh, regimen A uh, and B and E are, have been negative. And A was actually stopped early for futility because we, we look uh, often to see if it's not going to work, we want to stop it early so we don't waste anyone's time. Um, B was just, just clearly negative. Um, C and D both have positive results. It, it's a mixed picture. Uh, neither of them hit their primary outcome measure, but uh, regimen C, which is by clean, this is the drug that works on energy metabolism. There was a, a large survival benefit um, in, in this study and also time to key clinical events like time to by PAP use or G-tube um, or hospitalization. So, and that was quite a robust finding and it was very similar. It is very similar to results they have in the study they were doing in Australia and in uh, recently analyzed um, uh, on our compassionate use study uh, showing when we compared it, uh, the data to people in um, the PROACT database and natural history studies also showing that same survival benefit. So they are moving forward to planning a phase three trial uh, regimen D uh, for dopamine um, similarly didn't hit on its primary outcome measure of AOSFRS, but did have a statistically significant effect on um, uh, digital outcomes of, of voice and speech. So articulation rate, articulation, a, a couple different features of that, and, and also on bulbar function on the AOSFRS. When we looked at subsets of people in prolenia, like people early and fast, who might be a little faster progressing, more like the uh, Centaur Amlex trial, we also saw positive effects both on ALSFRS and neurofilament. So a lot that it was learned about those two, and those are both moving forward to planning phase three. Um, the triolose we just announced, it was negative. I have a few slides of, of that um, that I'll show you. And regimen F and G are currently still enrolling, uh, and so I don't have any results from there. So I'm just going to show you a few slides on regimen E. We have shared these results with the participants in the um, in the platform trial, as well as those who were in the NIH-funded EAP, um, and uh, we we just uh, sent out a press release on it. So for regimen E, Prelos, um, we used. The active data from the um, 120 or so people on, on the triolose, and we compared them to the shared placebo data from all the other regimens, so A, B, C, D, and then it, their own uh, uh, people on placebo. Um, in general, the groups were very balanced in terms of demographics, um, things that are important for kind of rate of progression. Um, 
and that, that's important also Rilazole use, Adarabone use, baseline neurofilament, um, and baseline ALSFRS4. There was a slight difference with the group on the, on the actual um, trilose having a slightly shorter time since in, um, symptom onset, but these are variables that we pre-specify and you adjust in the models for any imbalances between the groups. Um, I'm gonna just show you two of these concert figures. This is kind of showing the flow of patients in the study. So on your right, you see 171 people were, um, uh, you know, came in interested in being part of regimen E. Few were excluded for various reasons. 161 were randomized into regimen E, of which um, 41 were on placebo and 120 got active drug. But on the left, you see the people from the regimens A, B, C, and D. Uh, of those 686 people, 489 were on active drug in either A, B, C, or D. Uh, but 164 had gotten placebo from those groups and were combined with the 41 from regimen E for 205 people. So this is where you get the power uh, of the shared placebos. So now looking at the, you know, the 120 on triolose and the 205 on placebo, um, this is what happened. So a few people discontinued early. Um, so there were more people on, on the placebo groups who completed the six months, um, 85% versus 77%, but everybody's included in the, in the final analysis. The main outcome measure is something that uh, we're all familiar with, ALSFRS, but it's also, uh, um, we account for um, the survival as well. And that's something that the FDA and the field thinks is very important. You have to you really look at both of them. And there's a very complicated statistical way to do this that I, I, can, I won't be able to explain today, but we have a nice paper published as a free download on it. And we will definitely uh, have a webinar with our statisticians explain. And then we look at other uh, markers um, as shown here in our key secondary. Um, and I'm also gonna show you the neurofilament data. So uh, this was a really well done study and, and I'm really grateful for the people that came and were part of the study and for the sites uh, who um, really uh, conducted the study well. And it gave us clear answers, maybe not the answers we wanted, but very clear uh, that triolose was not effective in slowing down disease progression. It didn't hit on the primary or any of the, any, any of the secondary endpoints um, and um, and we didn't also see anything on, on neurofilament. We we showed the data to the um, the NIH DSMB for the compassionate use, and they recommended stopping the compassionate use for people on it. Uh, we had already stopped the open label extension because the company had stopped it early for financial reasons in, in a mid, mid trial. I'm just going to show you two graphs, and this is our, our our how we look at the primary outcome measure. And um, when we say something doesn't work, we're really looking at this combined measure of function and survival. Here on the left is the function graph. And, and I'm sorry to use this, the word, but this you know, we, we have to be open and transparent about the result. But th th this graph is on people who survive. So, so um, when you see this difference, green uh, versus uh, the gray, um, you're looking at the, uh, the rate of change in function in, in uh, what we call the, the survivors. And, and so that you can't just look at that because you're otherwise excluding people who might be having the worst outcome. So the, there's really a combined way, way of looking at it. And as you can see on the right with the survival graph that the treated group did a little worse on survival than the placebo. But when you look at the, if, if that's what we call the survivors is a little better on the function. But when you combine this into this important combined score, there's no effect of the drug. Um, it, it's, a, it's important to look at both. Um, we looked at also uh, some of the other measures, and this is just showing the breathing and the strength and really no difference between the groups at 24 weeks. Um, we also looked at neurofilament and didn't see a change uh, with the, the placebo in blue and the trilose in, in red. There's some variability. This is a variable marker, but um, those the lines kind of over uh, across, uh, so there's no effect on neurofilament. So we really recommended that this drug doesn't work and we should move on to, to uh, other options and other better things. We will definitely have a, a, a more full webinar with the statisticians and go through all the data, but I wanted to give you the highlights. So on to something hopefully more positive. So what, what's coming up in the future? There's a lot going on. Um, and I, this is just a few of the um, active trials and I'll, I'll go through some of these with you. Um, uh, PTC uh, is um, 
I'm going to show you one slide on that, but that is a fully enrolled phase two trial now um, and done globally. Um, Curalis is a um, one of those gene therapy studies that I mentioned that are is for uh, all forms of ALS so that increase uh, a protein called Staphylin 2. Sphingogenics is a drug that works on um, synapses and, and the repair pathway. Uh, CKO803 is a as a, in an early phase trial is a drug that improves um, your Treg cells and it decreases inflammation. In ION363 is a drug that for uh, people with uh, genetic form of the illness called plus ALS. There's also three new funded uh, EAPs or compassion use studies by the Act for ALS funds. Uh, one with clean, one with predopidine. Those are the regimen C and D from the platform trial. And one with the company RAPA, uh, which has a, an approach to also improve T regulatory cell functions. And those should all be starting very soon. Um, I think that one of them has already started the clean. And there's many other uh, small early phase trials. You can find all these on clinicaltrials.gov. I know IMALS also has a great trial finder, and ALS TBI also is a great trial finder. So just uh, briefly, so PTC is a company that has a drug uh, that inhibits um, something called lipoxinase. And when they do that, they decrease um, something called arachidonic acid, and they can improve uh, markers of inflammation. So this is really targeting a couple pathways, uh, lipid oxidation, neuroinflammation, protein aggregation, aggregation, and ferroptosis. So they um, already uh, fully enrolled 258 uh, participants at 80 centers throughout the world. Uh, it's a 24-week uh, uh, randomized period and then uh, followed by a 28-week open label extension. So the good news is it enrolled very fast and, and this will be uh, the one of the next ones to read out. Curalis is a, um, uh, a, a company here in Massachusetts that has this gene therapy uh, uh, to increase Staphylin 2. And this science is, is super exciting. Uh, as we know, in the motor neuron, there's a protein called TBP43 that's mislocated. It's in the wrong part of the cell, and it aggregates. And lots of people have studied what happens when it when that hap that that's in the wrong place and aggregated. And one of the main things it interacts with is something called Staphmin2 or STMN2, and it actually makes less of the full length protein of Staphmin2. And when you don't have full-length Staphmin 2, your motor axons uh, uh, pull back, they retract, they move away from your muscle or move away from the other neuron. If you replace Staphmin 2, um, that they actually regrow. So I, I kind of, I don't know if Charles calls this, but I call it a repair drug. Um, I'm very excited about this. And so this is a phase one trial. Uh, it's global. It's not in the U.S. yet. It's in Canada, in UK, and, and uh, other European countries. In the phase one, there's groups where they start with uh, one dose, and then uh, and, and once it, they show it's safe in that dose, they go into the next higher dose, and they keep going up, uh, looking at safety, but also looking at you know, biomarkers and clinical effects. So this is really one of the first trials to, to try to rescue Staphmin 2 expression. It's, again, using gene therapy technology, but for all forms of the AL, of ALS. Um, and right now they're in the second dose group, and uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that this will come to the U.S. as well, but uh, it's, it is a global study right now. The other one I wanted to talk to is um, by a company, Sphingogenics, and uh, they are also in the phase one trial. This is in Australia. This is a drug that um, increases uh, something called uh, synapses, so the connections between neurons. So also, I think, in the repair process. And so... They first did uh, safety in um, people without any illness, uh, which is very typical, single dose, which is sad, multi-dose, which is mad. Um, but then once they knew the, the top dose, they are now enrolling people with, with ALS. And so it, that's the part three, that's where they are right now. Um, so there, it's a small study um, in each dose group, nine people get the active drug, three get placebo for 28 days, and then, then people get a 28 days also open label extension. Mainly, this is looking at, are you getting the right dose? Is it safe? Um, and also some preliminary efficacy data and biomarker data. So I'm going to end with something I'm oops, really excited about, um, which is uh, this new initiative uh, between everything ALS 
and uh, uh, a partnership, uh, a merger with uh, Cure AOS, uh, uh, two foundations coming together to do something big. Um, and I'm happy to be working with them. And, and the idea here is that there's so much data out there now on ALS and there's new technologies and we really have to sh shake this up to move uh, faster to understand the root cause of the illness um, and to also develop new treatments and to use AI to see if we can understand the subsets of people and target uh, illness better. So this is a big, bold initiative to raise, I think initially a hundred million dollars to create hubs really all over the world that are sharing data, working together, bringing AI um, a technology to ALS to try to um, you know, solve it so that we can um, focus on the idea of repair and regeneration and uh, move away from the idea of slowing down the illness, but really about stopping it and reversing it. So um, there'll be more to come on that, a whole nother uh, uh, evening, ho uh, hopefully uh, focused on that. So I, I talked a lot and I hope, I hope I left time for questions, but everything I do is with a lot of people. Um, and this is just a nice picture of our Niels group. Thank you. Thank you, Merit. Um, that was fantastic. And um, we have a lot of questions, as you expected. And um, uh, as Merit said, we did launch uh, Vision 2030. So our goal is to make substantial progress by 2030 and mainly focused on repair, regeneration, and halting the disease. And there is more on v2030.org. And like Merit said, we'll have a completely different uh, session just on that. But um, Going into the question, um, um, Martha um, is Beach is going to join me, and um, both of us are going to um, do, do the moderation. And the first question is: Can you expand about the genetic therapy for SOD one? Is this called SADI or different from called SADI? It is called SADI. Yes, so that's uh, that's the name of it. The first name was Tafersin, and then they got um, when it went on the market, it's called SADI, but it's a gene therapy for people with SOD1 ALS. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Merritt. So I know you talked a lot about this tonight. We obviously, uh, Relivrio, the data, the results have been out. Can you just expand? We have some people asking, just, um, uh, just expand a little bit more on your thoughts that help with the data on the uh, second trial proving no real effects. Yeah, I, I think the, um, you know, the data is clear that it doesn't have an effect and it's a big study and a long study. And so we, we have been, you know, at our clinic advising people to, to stop it. You can, you can stop it, you know, cold turkey. You don't have to uh, lean off of it. Um, you know, I, I think that this is a risk of small studies and not just in ALS in every, every illness that, um, that sometimes with uh, small studies, you don't have groups that are totally balanced and uh, you, you could be misled either way. Um, and that's why you need the second study. Uh, so, but there are many times where it works the other way that the, the small study is predictive of success, uh, but you just have to do the second study to be confident. Thank you. I'm so glad that you mentioned that. I think sometimes we, uh, some people, um, they hang their hats on the first study, but thank you for uh, sharing that. So the next question uh, is, um, can you briefly share if there is any current research related to C9 gene therapy? Yeah, there's there's a ton of research on C9. So we know there were two trials uh, of uh, gene therapies in C9 that did not work. And C9 is a much more complicated uh, genetic mutation than SOD1. It's in what we call the repeat disorders. And, and it's the same challenges are in other repeat disorders like Huntington's and spinal cerebellar atrophy. And the reason I'm bringing that up is all those fields are trying to figure out why this for, these first approaches didn't work and is there a way to do it better? So there's a couple companies working on ways to use CRISPR to cut out the mutation, other ones trying to block both what we call strands, both strands. So people want to solve very much. The C9 is the most common genetic form of ALS. It also causes in some people, frontal temporal dysfunction, but also, you know, someone might figure it out for Huntington's disease and the way that works will help likely for C9. So there's a whole community trying to work on these repeat disorders. Excellent. Good. So um, with all the talk about stem cells and neurone, there's a lot of questions related to um, the availability of stem cells, especially for those with ALS in the advanced stages. Can you share your thoughts on that? 
Well, I think that there's a couple of different types of stem cells. So the neuron was a, what we call a mesenchymal stem cell, and uh, it comes from your bone marrow. It usually makes your red cells. Your, um, but here they're using them as a, a tool to decrease inflammation in the CSF. As you know, the phase three study they did uh, when they looked at everybody was negative. Uh, but then when they looked at people earlier in the illness, they did see some benefit. Um, but that also means that people later in the illness didn't, you know, went the other direction um, because on average it didn't, they didn't see anything. So they are planning, they're doing the right thing, I think, which is if you see a signal in the subpopulation is to repeat the study in that subpopulation. So that that's where uh, they're planning their phase 3B. Um, there is another company in South Korea. Um, they used to be called CoreStem. They've changed their name. I can't remember the new name, but they are doing a, a, a study also with mesenchymal stem cells, and they're in a phase three trial. Um, I think I think they might still be enrolling. They might be close to not uh, to finish, but we will have those results as well. So in a way, we have they're slightly different, but we'll have two two uh, trials. Very nice. Thank you. So the, the question now pivoting to uh, care, a um, lot of the patients, I mean, people with ALS are bodybuilders or athletes. So what kind of exercise do you recommend once they've been diagnosed with ALS? Yeah, there, there have been some studies that show that people who do um, kind of toning type exercises and as well as aerobic, that they function much better. So, that, so we typically recommend, um, you know, things like, you know, pool, you know, if people like to go in the pool, like pool therapy or uh, like yoga or Pilates or, or um, you know, low weights uh, in repetition, um, but to try to avoid things that are um, like heavy body, really anything that rips a muscle is probably not a good thing. Um, but but there, there, there are now a couple of studies that show people function much better if they do that kind of toning type exercise. Thank you. Thank you. This is a this is a jam packed one, <laughs> Dr. Merritt. Okay. So um, the order of cell death with ALS, and you've already talked about how, and we know that it's very complex. You showed some of the diagrams, but can you talk a little bit about the path, just the uh, trajectory of cell death as we know in ALS? Yeah, it's a complicated uh, question, I'm not, and I don't know any that anyone really knows for sure. But it it feels like this big puzzle that's getting filled in. Um, you know, one of the early changes, uh, it looks like something called a nuclear pore defect. So what that means is your genetic material is in something called the nucleus, and it should stay in there. But in people with ALS, there's a defect in um, something called a, a nuclear pore, and, and, and that's letting things out of the nucleus that shouldn't get out, like TDP43. So uh, Je Dr. Jeff Rothstein has worked and others on this, and that seems to be an early finding. Um, what we don't know is what comes first? So when that happens, we then see TDP43 go in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. But what we don't know is, is it the TDP43 in the wrong place that causes the nuclear pore problem, or is it the nuclear pore that causes the TDP43? But we know those two things are important. Inflammation and all the downstream things seem to come after that, that biology, the nuclear pore and the um, TDP43 biology. But well, there's still a lot more to figure out by that. Yes. Well, you did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. The next question is that now that we know that Relivrio is not uh, recommended um, for the people with ALS, what are the other approved FDA approved, uh, um, you know, medication that you would recommend for slowing down the degenerative process? Well, that's well, Relizol. And there's still radicava, and I'm still prescribing that until I, I see more data on the repeat study uh, by the other company. New Dexta is something that I um, give uh, people I care for who have uh, one of two or three symptoms, uh, something called pseudobulbar affect, which someone might feel more uh, emotional or express emotions more than they feel, or people who have bulbar uh, dysfunction. And there's been you know a study that we did a long time ago that suggests that Nudexa can help speech and swallowing. Um, and then for people with the genetic form of ALS by SOD1, the Calsati. Um, but I think it's, uh, you know, that's not enough, obviously. So then it's really about clinical trials or compassionate use access and, and trying to, to have some other options. Thank you, Mara. Thank you.
So can you share a little bit about what maybe the next regimens in the platform trial will be at Healy? Yeah, so we we um we're gonna have a little bit of a of a break, which is it isn't perfect, but it's hard to time all these things. So we 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 um we're in discussions with four companies of which um two have contracted with us and two haven't we've selected them, but they haven't quite contracted. Um, so I'm, unfortunately, because of my confidentiality agreements with them, I can't quite announce them yet. But as soon as they you know, finish signing everything, uh, they will announce them. But I think we're probably talking about the fall for the next next one. And so we're going to use this time. And like obviously, we're finishing F and G during this time. We're going to use this time to go back to the FDA because everybody's changed in the FDA from when we first went there in, in 2019. Um, and sh share our learnings from the first five um, and see if we need to change anything or do anything differently um, in the meantime. Thank you. So um, as we have seen a lot more gene therapy work in SOD1, uh, as you mentioned, FUS and C9, um, are there any uh, gene therapy work that's being done on NEK1 mutation? That's a, that's a really good question. I, I think there uh, there is. Um, what I do for when I see anybody who doesn't have either FUS, SOD1, or C9 and has another gene is, is uh, work with um, Neil Schneider at, um, at Columbia because he has an, an NIH grant to develop gene therapies for these rare forms of ALS. And uh, Brian Trainer at the NIH who's working also on this with him and uh, on a nonprofit called N. Lauren. You can actually apply to N. Lorem. Um, they're, they're an offshoot of Ionis, which is the gene therapy company that made the S, the uh, Calsati. And they will help, they'll tell you if it's, um, you can make a gene therapy for that gene mutation and then um, you can, and they can help. Um, so I, I don't know where, I know I've asked a few times for NEC1, and I think they're working on it. Um, but uh, um, I think the person with the most up-to-date knowledge would be Dr. Neil Schneider at Columbia. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have the next question is with the neurofilament light chain biomarker. Um, you've been talking a lot about the different. Obviously, we know the uh, complex pathways, but do you believe that there's um, th is that pretty much a biomarker that you think is applicable to all the pathways that you've been studying? It's a really good question. I, I'd say we we don't know yet. So I, I think we almost need one more. We need many more positive drugs, but we need another positive drug that also lowers neurofilament to be 100% sure. Right now, we know, for example, that Relivrio does not affect neurofilament, and, 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 and now we know that doesn't work. Radicava doesn't affect neurofilament. We have some questions about whether that works or not, and, and Rilazole doesn't affect uh, neurofilament. So it might be, end up being a very good predictor, but I, I think we need to um, a few more drugs that actually have a positive effect and see because um, I don't want to throw out any drug that might work just because it doesn't affect neurofilament until we're absolutely sure that that's a 100% predictor. Thank you. So can you comment on uh, the clinical trial by Dr. Oslinder um, with AKV9 developed by Dr. Silverman? Sure, yeah. And I am on their S their science advisory board. Um, they... Um, they have, um, they're moving forward on phase one testing and uh, like, like sphingogenics, they're starting with uh, people without the illness, healthy controls, which is very typical for phase one to do single dose and multi-dose, but that, that is, uh, that's planned. Thank you. Yes, and we have another question. So the ALS FRS revised score is often used as an endpoint to look at the results of studies, are there other instruments, measurement instruments that are out there similar that may be considered, or can you talk about those? Yeah, I mean, people are trying to make a better version of it. It's, it's still pretty good. I know there's a lot of um, ALS FRS, uh, I don't know if it's bashing, but but I mean, it, it is approved by the FDA and, and the European, and, and some drugs have been approved by it, but it does, it is kind of, gross. It, 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 there's, uh, in terms of, it's not very sensitive. So we do need to develop better ones. Obviously, obviously everything ALS is trying to develop um, with a lot of people, digital markers that could be, uh, could be measured more frequently and in the home. I think that my hope is that eventually those will, will um, overtake ALS FRS, but you have to almost prove that they're, 
um, that they can change with the positive drug before they can really be the primary. Wonderful, thank you. So there has been a lot of questions on the chat on B12. So um, is, does it, is this effective in the first year of the diagnosis? Or if somebody has been diagnosed six years ago, is it still useful? Should they continue taking the B12? Um, any thoughts there, Mara? Yeah, so the, the, the two, there have been two studies in, in Japan. The first one, they took a broad group of participants. Um, and, and when they looked at everybody, it didn't work. So, but then they looked at a subset of people in the first 12 to 15 months of symptom onset, and it did have an effect in that group. And there was a large effect um, on, on um, survival. That wasn't enough to get approved in Japan. So they did another study where they just took people in the first 12 months and, um, and just followed them for 16 weeks. And they showed about a 40 or so percent slowing. That's all the data we have on it. So I, I think it, it probably, doesn't help people later in the illness based on that first study. We don't know how long one has to uh, keep it. It's not an FDA or J Japanese or European approved drug for ALS. I mean, it has these two positive studies, but it's not yet, yet uh, marketed. Okay, thank you. And we are going to, we, we've had some great questions tonight and we're going to end with this one. Okay. So um, what are your thoughts? I'm sure you've heard of the Deanna protocol. But we have a lot of people on tonight and that have asked, do you recommend it? I don't uh, proactively recommend Deanna, but I don't um, I don't uh, not recommend it, I guess I would say. So I, I've looked at all the ingredients. I think everything's perfectly safe in there. I don't know whether it works or not. I, I um, but if someone wants to try it, um, I, I you know I'm, I'm I'm obviously supportive of that. So that was a wishy-washy answer, but that is how what I do in clinic. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Merit, for uh, spending the hour with us. And we so appreciate you not going to your living room and staying at your work late in the night there and uh, giving us this opportunity to come to people's living room and have this, you know, one-on-one -on -one experience. And uh, this, this, I can't tell you enough about what a difference it makes. So thank you so much. And you have a great evening. And we just open up for the open forum next thank, thank you. you good to see everybody thank thanks you. for having me bye, bye thank you folks it's that time of day and i love it when we come to an end of our program with a big smile and lots of hellos and goodbyes to all of the people that we've seen here today so on three one two three let's say good night to everybody thanks good night, everybody good job yeah. and larry Bye. And Dave, Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Michael. Ken, Art, Sean, and Chuck Shaw. Good job, Ken. Chuck, good to see you, buddy. And Thanks, Jubilant. Dan. God bless hey, all. What a, what a name, Jubilant. You just brought a vibration to the show. Thank you so much. And Janie. Thank you, guys. Uh, folks, it'll be a short, oh, Faith, thank you. So, you know, folks, the four leggeds that you bring, Please, they make us all feel like we're we're a, a good animal too. And Francois, thank you for staying up and uh, and coming and sharing some time with us. All right, and Paul West, my friend, thank you. It's a pleasure to see you. That's right. And uh, Tony, I see you got your angel next to you, so uh, be sure that you look her in the eye tonight and wink. It it says a lot. And Jose, thank, thank you very much for what you do. Tony, we are here and like, just you. like your wife, because we all have part. And, uh, yes. and this is the place to share it. And Patty Hancock, thank you. thank you for coming tonight, Patty. You are awesome. And Jose, your <laughs> angel knows heart work. Yeah, look at that. It's a, you know, one of. <laughs> One of our dear folks one night said, I can't talk, but I can make a heart. And so, folks, yes. we're all heroes. Believe it. Next time you look in the mirror, smile and say, come on, we can do this. So anyway, <laughs> Mike, Shiv, good night, Mike. Thank you for being here with us. Bye, friends. All See right. Yes, and Eddie, you're always here. Thank you, my brother. Bye, my friend. Uh, all right, okay. folks, we're going to press the button, 
so that we can let some time go by and get back together. All right, let's do it. Night. Good night, everybody. Night. Night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.